the many attainments of General Jose Manuel Rafael Simeon de Mier y Terran seem to justify such a grandiose name. Born in 1789, he earned a degree from the College of Mines, distinguishing himself in engineering and mathematics. During the Mexican Wars for Independence, he sided with the Republicans and performed yeoman service as an artillery officer. In 1821, he fought alongside General Augustin de Iturbide to drive out the Spaniards. During the early 1820s, the new government enlisted him in an array of positions. In 1822, he was a member of the Committee on Colonization of Unoccupied Lands in the First Constituent Congress. In 1824, he rose to the rank of Brigadier General and later served briefly as Minister of War. In a nation where the majority was illiterate, Tehran appeared an intellectual giant. In 1827, President Guadalupe Victoria selected him to lead a scientific and boundary expedition into Texas to observe and document the natural resources, the Native American tribes, and finally to verify the Mexican-U.S. boundary between the Sabine and the Red Rivers. That was the official rationale for the expedition. Unofficially, the president tasked Tehran to secretly ascertain the number and motives of the American immigrants. He was an unlikely choice. The president was a federalist, while Tehran was a centralist. Nevertheless, the general's loyalty and acumen were beyond reproach. Notwithstanding Tehran's politics, his was an opinion one could rely on. The expedition was an elaborate enterprise. Leaving Mexico City, November 10, 1827, Tehran traveled in a prodigious coach, much carved, inlaid with silver, and escorted by mounted dragoons. A number of authorities accompanied him. Rafael Chauvel, a mineralogist, Lieutenant Jose Maria Sanchez y Tapia, a cartographer and illustrator, and Jean-Louis Berlandier, a Swiss botanist and zoologist, all kept careful records and sketched the flora and fauna. On March 1st, 1828, the Boundary Commission reached San Antonio de Bay. The bounty of the countryside moved Berlandier to eloquence. Peach trees were in bloom at the end of February. Nut trees burgeoned. The willow and the poplar were covered with catkins. In a word, all nature was already animated, although winter was not yet past. Even so, Bear's citizens made a less favorable impression. Poor farmers lived there in wretchedness, insulted at every turn by the Indians. The Bejarinos also failed to impress Sanchez, who observed, the character of the people is carefree. They are enthusiastic dancers, very fond of luxury. The worst punishment that can be inflicted upon them is work. Doubtless, there are some individuals out of the 1,425 that make up the total population who are free from these failings, but they are very few. On April 27, the Commission arrived in San Felipe de Austin, the capital of Stephen F. Austin's college. The impresario received the general with appropriate their relations were respectful and proper, but never warm. Each 
sized up the other like boxers before a prize fight. Tehran never recorded his impression of Austin, but Sanchez did. Austin's obsequious manner repelled him. As he logged in his diary, the diplomatic policy of this impresario, evident in all his actions, has, one may say, lulled the authorities into a sense of security, while he works diligently for his own ends. Stymied by the Brazos River floodwaters, the expedition remained in San Felipe for two weeks. Nacogdoches was the next destination, but in clement weather, muddy roads, and a plague of mosquitoes prolonged their travel to three weeks. Tehran well knew that Nacogdoches had been the hotbed of the Fredonian Rebellion, and he expected the worst. As he approached that troubled community, what he witnessed confirmed his fears. As one travels from there to this town, Mexican influence diminishes so much that it becomes clear that in this town, that influence is always non-existent. Lieutenant Sanchez also noted that Nacogdoches Tejanos had embraced the speech, dress, and manners of their American neighbors. Accustomed to continuous commerce with the North Americans, they have imitated their customs. And so it may truthfully be said that they are Mexicans only by birth, or even the Castilian language they speak with considerable ignorance. Tehran thought Nacogdoches Americans cut from an entirely different cloth than Austin's deferential columns. The North Americans are haughty. They shun society by inclination and because they disdain it. They devote themselves to industrial enterprises and to the hardest labors as well as to the grossest vices, with exceptional ardor. They do not think they have relaxed from their grueling task until drunkenness dulls their senses. And in that state, they fierce and scandalous. According to Tehran, Austin's colony was the only one where the American immigrants even tried to understand and obey the laws of the country, and where, as a result of the enlightenment and integrity of its impresario, they have a notion of our republic and its government. As far as Tehran could tell, the American settlers were still devoted to their Madisonian institutions. They all go about with their constitution in their pocket demanding their rights and the authorities and functionaries that it provides. The Norte Americanos may never have read the Mexican Constitution of 1824, but they knew all about the Philadelphia Charter of 1787. Like the Lewis and Clark expedition before it, Ron's Bounty Commission made momentous contributions to scientific knowledge. Even now, its records provide historians with the best source material for the study of Texas during its colonial period. But Mexican officials were more interested in the general's secret report on foreign immigration. When they finally received it, the commentary set into motion a series of events that would shake Texas to its very foundation.